Hi, Yasmina. Thank you very much for the introduction. And hi, everyone. My name is Michael Snoyman. As Yasmina mentioned, I'm the author of Developing Web Applications with Haskell and Yasod. I'm also the lead developer of the Yasod Web Framework Project. Uh, and I'm going to be discussing uh, different uh, concepts in designing type-safe Haskell APIs. A lot of the stuff is, uh, comes from uh, my work with Yasod but the topics we're going to be covering are not ESOD specific. Uh, this applies to Haskell in general. Okay, so the first question that we're going to want to address is, what is type safety? If that's, what, if that's our focus, we have to understand exactly what it is that we're doing. So type safety is really built based off of two different components. One is static typing, and one is strong typing. Uh, these are two different concepts that end up getting confused quite often, uh, so I want to define them clearly right now. Static typing is, basic, is, this, is the fact that types are checked at compile time instead of being checked at runtime, as opposed to strong typing, which is how much you're able to express your invariance via the type system. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. We have a little bit of an explanation a uh, demonstration of, the, of this distinction. So starting off in the left column, you see that we're talking about strong typing. Uh, in the top left cell, we look at Haskell. Now when we compile the code above, hello plus one, in Haskell, this turns into a compile time error. This code just doesn't work, and the compiler is able to catch it. As opposed to a dynamic language like Python, which also, Python is also strongly typed, but since it's a dynamically typed language, this error is not caught at compile time, it's caught at runtime. So this turns into a runtime error. On the right hand side, in the right column, we're looking at weak type, weakly typed languages, such as C. Now, it's a bit debatable whether C falls into the category, but we'll use that for the, we'll use it for this example. Hello plus one in C actually treats hello as an address. When you do plus one, we end up moving the address, we move the pointer a little bit, uh, one character farther in, and we end up getting the string ELLO, hello. Uh, so we can see that what's gone on here is the compiler has gone ahead and noticed that we're trying to add one to a string and treated it as something slightly different. In Haskell, this wouldn't be allowed. In Python, this wouldn't be allowed. Um, but this is all done at compile time. All the, everything here is checked, and some things would not be allowed. Uh, on the other hand, we have examples such as JavaScript where a huge number of things are allowed to go through. So in this case, when we have hello plus one, we actually have, uh, we have some type coercion. The one, which was originally an integer, is automatically converted to a string. We have hello plus the string one, so it uh, becomes string concatenation, and we get the, the final string hello one. That's just a basic breakdown of strong versus weak dynamic versus static. So let's go ahead and drill in a bit further. Uh, so static typing, the, uh, the opposite of static typing is dynamic typing. So that's exemplified in languages such as Python or Ruby. Now it's in, static typing is basically a binary choice. It's either static or it's dynamic. There's not really much more to it than that. Uh, there, are, there are, even within statically typed languages, some features that exhibit symptoms of dynamic typing. So for example, in C++, we have RTTI and uh, runtime type information. In Java, we have reflection. And even in Haskell, which many people consider one of the strongest, most statically typed languages, we have the typable class, which does allow you to have some aspects of dynamic typing. So for the most part, a language is either static or it's dynamic. Uh, but there are some exceptions to the rule. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, now strong typing isn't nearly as, as clear cut. So the opposite of strong typing is weak. And some examples people might give are Perl or JavaScript. Uh, usually when you think of weakly typed languages, there's usually some kind of automatic coercion or automatic casting that occurs. Now as opposed to static typing, with strong typing, it's not really a binary choice. There's a large spectrum. There's not really a clear definition that a certain language is strongly typed as opposed to another language being weakly typed. In C++, 
some cases, people generally agree. Haskell is generally agreed to be a strongly typed language. JavaScript is generally agreed to be a weakly typed language. On the other hand, there are some other, there are some other languages out there that fall in between. Many people would say that C++ is strongly typed, whereas C becomes a bit more questionable. And Java also generally considered strongly typed, but when you compare it to, the, to Haskell, it definitely exhibits more weakly typed, more weak typing than Haskell does. Now beyond the language itself, the fact of the matter is that you can encourage strong typing via the libraries and via the, the actual style that the programmer uses uh, to a great extent. Uh, and I'll give you an example in a moment of within Haskell, you can even have weakly typed programs. Uh, so the question is, what does it really mean then to have a language which is strongly or weakly typed? So in general, I would say that it has, has to do with how easy it makes it to use strong typing. Some languages such as, such as Java definitely have the ability to let you do a lot of strong typing, but the verbosity involved usually, usually inhibits people from actually doing so. So here, let's take a look at the next slide, an example of some weakly typed Haskell. So we have this program which is going to test whether someone is an adult. And this is all, this is all type checked. The compiler has reviewed this, this code. This code is valid. This code passes type checking. And yet it just doesn't feel right. We have this function which is taking a string and performing some IO action. By looking at the type signature, I have no idea what that function is really doing. For all I know, it's reading a file, it's firing the missiles, it's reading from a database, I don't know. Um, then the input is a string. I don't know what that string is doing. Is that, is that someone's name? Is that someone's age? Is it both? In this case, you can see by the usage that it looks like it's both. It's someone's name and it's someone's age. In the where clause, we're using this words function, which returns a list of the different words but we're forcing it to be a list of size two. So if someone happens to pass in a string that has more than two words or less than two words in it, this will break at runtime. Uh, we also use the read function, which is a partial function. And so if someone provides an invalid input, something which isn't a number, then it's not going to work either. So we can see that this is completely type checked. This is Haskell, so you would think it's, you know, Haskell, it has to be strongly typed. The fact of the matter is you can get away with writing some pretty weakly typed code even in a language like this. So the point to drive home here is we need to make sure that even if we're using a good strongly typed tool, we have to be good citizens as well and take advantage of it. Okay, so one, one last point that we're not going to be covering here is the motivation. We're talking about, we're talking quite a bit about the fact that we want to have static typing, we want strong typing, but we aren't really explaining what the advantage is. Uh, so I considered uh, including that in this talk. It's a bit of a longer discussion. I wanted to focus more on the code here, so I wrote a, up the explanation in a blog post. Anyone who's interested can go and find that post on usodweb.com. But the short answer, answer is that with type safety, we're able to reliably catch bugs at compile time instead of waiting for them to pop up at runtime. And in general, when you have a bug at compile time, it's much easier to fix than something at runtime. Okay. So let's actually jump into some code examples. We'll start off with some basics of Haskell. One of the nice advantages we have is, as I mentioned, as I mentioned briefly earlier, verbosity is an enemy here. When you have to write verbose code, people tend not to do it. So on the flip side, in Haskell, we have the ability to have quite, quite terse code for certain use cases. So let's say that we're going to write a function. We could say that this is a function for allowing people to log into our operating system. And we're going to verify whether the username and password is correct. So we start off with the bad version. This is a function that just takes two, two strings and gives you back an IO action running and that returns a boolean. And that doesn't really tell me very much in the type signature itself. Now, I might guess that the first one is a username and the second one is a password, but I could be mistaken. Maybe for this function, password is supposed to come first, username is supposed to come second. And all of this can be explained in documentation, and it should be explained in documentation, but, it, but just based on the types, there's no information there, and therefore the compiler is not able to enforce anything for us. 
also that bool response, well, probably true means it's a valid response, it's a valid login, and false means invalid. But again, there's nothing to guarantee that that was the, in that was the intention. So below we have the better version. We are going ahead and using these new type wrappers. So now that we have a new type for username and a new type for password, it's impossible to accidentally pass in the wrong information to the parameters. If you try to pass in the password as the first parameter, then the compiler will stop you and won't allow it to happen. Same thing with username. And instead of passing back a plain Boolean, we now have this data type called validity, which gives much more information to the user as far as what's, what's being returned here. Also later on, if you're passing this validity parameter around in other parts of your, pro of your program, it's virtually impossible to get it confused with some other Boolean uh, value that you might be using for a completely different purpose. Okay. So next. Another thing that we, so in addition to being able to easily define new data types to help us out, we should also be taking advantage of the types that we already have. So for example, if you're going to be having, if you have a dictionary values, a key value combination, you could store it in an associated list, which is a list of pairs of values, but that's not nearly as expressive, expressive as a map. A map guarantees you that there are no repeated keys. It tells you that the order of the values don't, uh, the, val the order does not matter. And in addition, it happens to be a lot faster. It's a much more performant approach. Now obviously you can only use these more advanced data types if, they're, if their use cases actually apply. So in the case of map, we, you have to be dealing with data where you don't care about the order. If you need to keep a strict order of values, then a map won't work for you. But in many use cases, uh, the order is not important and therefore you can use it. Another example of a data type that should be used often is set. Instead of just having a list of values, specify that you don't want to have any repeated values and you can have cheap lookups. Again, you get a performance uh, boost. And in addition, you can go ahead and combine, combine these different kinds of data types together to get much more expressive statements. So for example, here we have a map from username to a set of permissions. This is a great way of, of specifying that a user is able to have different kinds of permissions, but you really can't have the same permission multiple times. That wouldn't really make sense. You couldn't give someone write access to a certain file twice. You can only have it once. So this type right in front of us, in, you know, it's still short. We're only looking at four words here. Uh, but it really does express a lot of information. So another thing that you want to keep in mind, though, in these kinds of uses, is to use the functions for, ma for manipulating them correctly. So for example, if you start using the unions um, function from the map, from map it could actually, you could end up wiping out some of the permissions from one of the maps if you have the same user in two different maps. So instead, make sure you're using unions with and set.union. Uh, for more details on all those pieces of information, look at the containers documentation. It's very thorough. It does a great job of explaining the issues. Okay. Another basic point is we should, whenever possible, be expressing our invariants in the types. Uh, for example, let's say that we're writing a web application. This web application is going to be asking for people's contact information. It's going to be asking for a phone number or an email address, or it will accept both pieces of information. But the one thing you can't do is provide neither. You have to provide some kind of a contact information. So the simple basic approach that we might want to take, well, we have two op optional pieces of information. Let's use a tuple. We'll go ahead and have a pair of maybe a phone number and maybe an email address. Now the problem is that this will allow you to, to allow the user to provide neither a phone number nor an email address, uh, which we don't want to do. That would, that would mean when we start pattern matching on this, there's going to be a whole extra case that we don't want to allow to happen, but we're going to have to start taking care of. So instead, a more resilient approach is to define a new data type. Again, we have this advantage in Haskell. We we have very terse definitions. Uh, we're able to define a brand new data type in just a few lines of code. And we have the advantage of some types. So putting all that together, we now have this data type at the bottom, contact info, that fully expresses our invariant. You can have only a phone number, only an email address, or a phone number and an email address. But there's no way that you could get 
anything else involved here. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and look at some of the questions now. We had a oh, – actually, Yasmina, did you want to uh, read any of the questions? Sure. We've got several good questions that are coming in, and we'll take a couple just in the order they came in, folks. Question from John. John asks, how does your strong week compare to safe slash unsafe, which I think is Cardelli's framework? Uh, I can't. I can't say that I'm actually familiar with Cardelli's framework of safe versus unsafe. Uh, the terms, I would say that this term safe and unsafe are fairly loaded. They mean a lot of different things. You know, they, safe and unsafe, it could refer to memory safety, which clearly isn't what we're talking about here. Uh, recently in the Haskell world, there's actually been an initiative called Safe Haskell, and there were, there's quite a bit of uh, debate up right now what exactly that means, uh, what it should mean versus what it actually means. Uh, a lot of the standard libraries in Haskell provide unsafe versions of functions. So unsafe perform I.O. Uh, isn't so much about type safety. There definitely is an aspect of type safety to it, but it really has more to do with referential transparency. So I can't say that I'm so familiar with those terms, but I would definitely, uh, at least for the, for the purposes here, I think that strong and weak gives at least a, somewhat of a clear definition, even though strong and weak, as I said, isn't exactly, it's not exactly a science, it's more, it's more of an art, I, uh, I can't really say how it would compare with safe and unsafe. Great, thank you. Question from Kevin. Kevin asks, Michael, are there features of Haskell's type system that you've tried out and decided to avoid? So some of the type class extensions uh, definitely get to be a little, I would say that those, the type class extensions can sometimes be dangerous. Uh, overloaded instances, for example, you know, there are definitely cases where it's very tempting to use an overloaded instance. Um, and it can definitely shorten code drastically. When you're defining, you know, when you're going to be defining a set of uh, instances for some monad transformers, and almost all of them are going to act one way, with one exception, it's very tempting to pull out overloaded instances uh, sorry, overlapping instances and allow that uh, to play in, but it just doesn't pay. Every time I've used overlapping instances, I've regretted it, and I don't think I've touched them in the past three years. Uh, there definitely, there probably are other examples. That's just the first one that comes to mind. Okay, and our last one we'll take right now is from Erland, and he asks, Yeso does not use the standard prelude, but avoids exporting partial functions like head. Are there any good use cases for partial functions, or should they always be avoided? I would definitely say that they should generally be avoided. There are use cases where a partial function is just, so you can, you can convince yourself that the partial function is going to work correctly, that there's no way that this final, you know, if you, let's say that you've been using a normal list throughout your entire program, but you really know with certainty that the list is never going to be empty. So maybe in a, and if you can really convince yourself of that, it's, there's not a huge downside to using head, except for the fact it's going to kill your maintainability. You know, going forward, you're not going to really know if someone, else, if someone else is going to make a change to the program, they're not going to be able to know that you've relied on this invariant. So definitely the better approach in that case would be to go ahead and use a different data type. Sometimes that's not available to you. Sometimes you're using someone else's library and you just don't have that option and you're stuck, you have to use a partial function. So yeah, there are cases where it's necessary. I would say that in those cases it's a necessary evil. And so avoid it when possible. Okay. okay. Those are all the questions that have come in for now, so we'll turn the program back to you, Michael. Okay, thanks. All right. So, so basically, to summarize what we're looking at, uh, what we've looked up, looked at up until now, we want to be using the right libraries. We want to be using the right approaches to things. Uh, file path. This is one of my pet peeves. One of the uh, things people in the community hear me bring up quite often. I don't like the fact that a file path is identical to a string. It, there's nothing in the type system to prevent me from using a normal string to try to open up a file. There are also character encoding issues. There are a lot of things involved. So for those kinds of cases, I recommend use a better library. Use system file path. 
We discussed containers earlier, uh, text, byte string, blaze HTML. There are a lot of really solid libraries out there today that will help you avoid these kinds of problems at the type level. And usually they happen to be much more efficient and that's just a great benefit as well. Okay, let's go on to the next section, the strings issue. Uh, the strings issue talks about a general class of problems where we have a whole bunch of different things that act like strings, kind of feel like strings, but are semantically different. So byte strings are streams of bytes as opposed to text, which is a stream of characters. And the inherent difference between the two of them is that there's some kind of implicit, in, uh, if you want to convert from text to byte string, there's some kind of implicit character encoding involved. Um, so when you're dealing with a language that doesn't make a strong distinction between the two of them, it's easy to forget about that character encoding that needs to be present and just make some assumption about it. Uh, and there are, there are other examples that we're going to get into as well. So one of the first tools in our chain from Haskell is this language extension called overloaded strings. Uh, overloaded strings basically allows you to type in a string literal into your program and have it converted automatically to some other data type. So remember, one of our themes here is people aren't going to use something unless it's easy to use. So if you have this difference between a byte string and a text and people have to write in a whole bunch of plumbing in order to get it to happen, people aren't going to do it. So instead, something like overloaded strings definitely makes the whole process simpler. Uh, this means that we have a lower barrier to entry for creating new types. So those examples that we gave earlier where we created a new type for a username and a, unit, and a new type for a password, we can go ahead and create appropriate type class instances for them and overloaded strings would allow us to use those, uh, use those uh, built in. A much more, some much more common examples are byte strings and HTML snippets, uh, which now not only are we able, in the case of HTML, not only are we able to use normal text as a, as a bit of HTML, but the language actually automatically performs some character, some entity escaping, which helps us prevent some kinds of inappropriate input. And we'll see a more solid example of that later. Another example that comes up uh, quite a bit, for me at least, is dealing with XML. When you have XML names, when you have the name of an XML uh, element or an XML attribute, it's not as simple as a piece of text. There's the text, there's an optional namespace, and there's an optional namespace prefix. So when you have those pieces of information, ideally you want to really put that into its own data type. But if, you, if people have to start playing around with the data type and start building up values every time they want to perform any kind of lookup, it becomes very tedious. So what's nice here is with overloaded strings, we're able to still keep the, the terseness, the precision of a normal string literal, but get the full expressivity of a proper data type. So if you compare this with some of the Java XML libraries, for example, you know, the built-in Java XML libraries have basically doubled the number of functions, one for with namespaces and one without namespaces. I think that our solution in Haskell is much more succinct and much more elegant. Uh, one of the downsides with overloaded strings that's been brought up in the Haskell community in the past is that there's really no compile time checking. So for example, if you type in a Unicode, a, a string that takes advantage of some Unicode characters beyond the range of ASCII or beyond the range of the first 255 characters, there's no obvious way to convert that into a byte string. And therefore, some, some information is actually lost if you treat such a string as a byte string. So some people think that this is a, this is a major issue and uh, would like to see it solved. Probably that's not going to happen. Probably the extension is going to stay the way it is for now. And in practice, I haven't actually heard of this being, being a real problem for most people. For people who are actually really concerned about it, there's another, type, uh, there's another language extension called quasi-quotes which is a bit more verbose, but could actually solve the issue entirely. So if you're interested in that, you can definitely look it up. We use that quite a bit in USODE. All right, so one of the great examples we have is this text versus byte string. I actually think that beyond anything else, one of the biggest advantages of this distinction we have in Haskell is that we're actually able to explain character encodings to people. It's a very complicated concept, but, in, but because of the type system in Haskell, it's pretty, it's almost straightforward to explain that we have one type for characters 
And here's a function that's able to convert a character into a sequence of, of uh, octets, of bytes. And here's another function that takes some bytes and tries to convert it into text, but doesn't always succeed. So as I said before, one of the great things here is all the character encodings have to be explicit. Uh, here in our first code example here, we're trying to turn the Hebrew term shalom into, its, you know, into the UTF-8 sequence, the sequence of bytes. And we had to use encode UTF-8. There's no such thing as turn a text into a byte string. It's, you have to know exactly how it is that you want to do that conversion. And if you try to treat a, a byte string as text and just print it out to the screen, as in the second example, that's caught at compile time. We find out immediately that that's not valid. Okay. Uh, the next example, Blaze HTML. This is becoming one of the most commonly used libraries in the, web, in the web development scene. It's a very fast library. It takes advantage of a lot of efficient buffer manipulations under the surface. And yet, it provides a, a type-safe, high-level API for users to take advantage of. So one of the great things it does is this automatic entity escaping, which avoids cross-site scripting attacks. So if you look at the first example, when we, when we have this string unsafe inside these angled brackets, uh, as soon as we try to render that, turn that into HTML, the, the type system knows that, oh, well, we're trying to convert a string into a bit of HTML. And therefore, we should use the function which automatically escapes all the entities. So the less than and greater than signs end up getting converted to their entity form. Now, obviously, we don't always want to do that. So in some cases, we really do have some HTML data. Maybe we pulled it out of a, out of a file that we had on our local uh, system. Maybe it's a blog post that someone wrote. And we trust them, and we want to be able to use their content as HTML. So in those cases, we have a function pre-escaped to markup, which says, no, I really know what I'm doing. Trust me, I don't want you to do any of that kind of escaping. Uh, so there, we're able, so what we've done here, instead of having to explicitly escape data, you don't have to explicitly mark data as safe. Mark, mark data as stuff that we trust, and it makes, it, turn, it basically it turns attacks completely on their head, as opposed to, by default, your code is, is vulnerable. Now, by default, your, co your, co uh, your code is safe. Another feature that we're able to use with the library like this is that we're able to create new types that have special features. So one of the features that we provide in USODE is this new type called text area. Uh, it's meant for receiving textual input from a user in a multi-line edit field. Now, when, you, when they type and enter, that just gets encoded as a new line a character. Uh, but when you export that to HTML, the new line character won't actually create a new line. So instead, when you have this text area, all of the new lines are automatically turned into break tags, to be our tags, so that the, the display actually comes out the way that, we were, that you would want it to come out. Now let's finish up this section with a word of warning. It's going too far. Uh, this is an actual example that really did happen. About a year ago, when I was working on some HTTP libraries, we originally used byte strings to represent the HTTP headers. Now, HTTP headers are required to be ASCII values. So byte string isn't exactly the correct piece of data to represent it, because we're not allowing arbitrary byte data and binary data to appear. In some ways, text makes more sense, because it really is textual data. But then on, on the flip side, text isn't valid either, because text can represent a whole bunch of different kinds of code points outside the range of ASCII that we're not allowed to use here. So of course, we go to our typical standard Haskell toolbox and say, I've got an idea. Let's create a new type. And that's exactly what I did. Created a new type called ASCII, wrapped it around a byte string for efficiency, and changed the library over. And now it was impossible to accidentally provide non-ASCII data. And the immediate result was everyone complained. It was too difficult to use. Uh, none of the, everyone was used to dealing with the functions from byte string, and you couldn't use those anymore, and therefore we reverted it. So the lesson I learned from that is that even if something is theoretically safer and theoretically a better approach, if it's too difficult to use, it's not better. Okay. Uh, before we get to the next section, are there any other questions? 
we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Harold would like to know, how does one know which right library to use? That, that is a great question. And the answer is there's no solid answer yet. Uh, one, one approach you can take is you can come to the community. The Haskell community is wonderful. It's a very engaging community. It provides lots of very great information. And people will be very happy to answer your questions. Sometimes there isn't consensus yet. And if you ask a question about one of those topics, you'll find out that there really isn't consensus. Um, other, in other cases, there really is only one solution these days for representing binary data, and that's the, the byte string package. There really is only one solution for text, and that's the text package. Um, I can't say that that's the case for everything. Obviously, you know, the web framework world, uh, I happen to think that USOTA is very nice. There are other, but there are other development environments available as well. Hapstack and Snap are both available. So you'll get different opinions. And when it comes to those, you're going to have to make a decision. Uh, hopefully going forward, we're going to be getting more architecture in the community to automate this process. Uh, the, main, the main package database is called Hackage. And hopefully at some point, some kind of voting, some kind of user feedback is going to be incorporated. And there are definitely, you know, and another possibility, different communities within the Haskell world have, a, have selected which packages they trust. So in the USOD world, we try in general not to rely on two different packages for one purpose. So if you come to the USOD community, if it's a uh, problem that we've had to solve, odds are we've already selected what we consider our winner, even if it's not a generally accepted answer yet. Perfect. And we have a question from Aaron. Aaron asks, what are the runtime performance implications of the strong typing examples you've shown? So the typing itself doesn't prov definitely doesn't uh, give any kind of runtime overhead. In many cases, it allows us to get more efficient code. When we have, you know, the, the best example I, I, I think is byte string and text. There we're using the right types, we're using the best types available, and it provides us a, a strong edge on performance. Uh, for, those of, for those people who aren't completely aware with it, of how it works, byte string and text use uh, packed data to represent uh, what we're looking at as opposed to using unpacked data. So in the old days, before we were using text, we would just have a list of characters, and that list of characters had a pretty high overhead. Each, each character had to have its own cell. Uh, I, think it, I, think someone, I think I've seen that it came out to about four, four or five machine words in order to represent uh, each character. As opposed to now with text, there's a small overhead for the entire piece of, uh, the entire piece of data. Uh, but besides that, the information is pretty densely packed. Byte string as well, I think there are nine bytes of overhead for a byte string, and otherwise it's very densely packed. Uh, so the strong typing can, is definitely an edge for performance. It helps out, and I wish I could speak more to the side of GHC, what kinds of compiler optimizations have, uh, have been allowed by it. Unfortunately, I don't know too many of the details. Uh, one small example I'll give is rewrite rules. Uh, I think Haskell may be unique. It's definitely the only language I've seen that has this level of customization where you're actually able to express optimizations in, the, in your code itself. So you're able to say, okay, even though concat you know, if you stick two maps together, if you try to apply a function to a list, two different functions to a list, even though that should really force you to allocate two separate lists, we can fuse that together into a single map and just compose those two functions together. And therefore, we're able to avoid a huge number of allocations. That's able to be expressed in, within the code itself, as opposed to needing to be built into the types and to the compiler. So the strong typing makes sure that what we're doing is valid. It's not going to blow up in our faces. Uh, and it allows us to do a lot of very neat tricks. Okay, and our last question for this portion is from Roman, and Roman asks, have you made some of those trade-offs on conduits, uh, libraries as well, uh, request headers as list of pairs instead of map, et cetera? Uh, so I'm guessing by the conduits library, you're talking about, say, HTTP conduit or Y, uh, the web application interface. Uh, in that case, it was actually the opposite. That wasn't, the trade-off was going in the opposite direction. It would have been more convenient to use the nicer types. 
we wanted to be able to use maps to represent the HTTP headers. The problem is that in some cases, some obscure cases granted, but in some cases, the order of the headers would actually matter. So by switching over to map, that would have been the incorrect data type. Uh, some people say that this, this is not something worth uh, worrying about. Uh, I believe SNAP, maybe even HapStack, both, uh, will use a map to represent the data. When we were analyzing this, we decided it wasn't, even though it was a nicer data type to be able to use, it made more sense to stick closer to the, closer to the initial representation, which kept the order of the headers. All right, so let's go on to our last section, which is some nice tricks in the, in the type system itself and some language extensions. So the first one I want to cover, this is, by the way, just a very small subset of the tricks available to us in Haskell. These are, uh, there are definitely many more out there, and if you want to have some fun, go ahead and look some of them up. You know, come to the community, ask questions on the mailing list. People have a lot of examples of these. So the first example, phantom data types. Let's give a practical motivating case. We have some database keys. All of them look the same. Uh, let's say we're dealing with a database where every key for a table is going to be an integer. So, if you, so a simple approach would be, okay, fine, we'll use an integer as the key for every single table. The problem is that there's nothing in the type system to prevent us from taking a key from the person table and using it, up, using it to look up a vehicle. And that's a problem. So our solution is, we'll use a phantom type variable. Um, so here we've defined two different data types, person and vehicle. And now we have this new type called key. And this key is, if you look on the right-hand side, it's just an integer. We're just wrapping around an integer. But on the left-hand side, we have this type variable called table. And that table isn't actually used anywhere in the definition as key. And that's why it's called a phantom. It's not really there. So what we're able to do with this is we're able to say, okay, let's define that a person key is a key for a person table, and a vehicle key is a key for a vehicle table. And this doesn't actually affect the representation of the data itself. The data is still just an integer, but we've encoded some more information in the type system itself. And one example of how we could, what we could do with this is we can now have a get function, which takes a key for a specific table and will only give you back a value for that table. It won't allow you to accidentally give in a vehicle key and get back a person. Uh, this is actually a technique that we use in the persistent library quite a bit and prevents us from making a lot of silly mistakes when writing code. So building on top of phantoms is something called gadgets, the generalized algebraic data types. Gadgets are basically a way that you're able to use phantoms in, in the data constructors themselves. So let's give an example. We're dealing with this data type called person. And a person has a name, an age, and an ID. Uh, and we actually, now we actually want to be able to perform some different kinds of operations on a person. We're going to want to be able to sort. We're going to want to be able to filter. But we want to make sure that we're sorting and filtering where it's appropriate. And we want to make sure we're using the correct types. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a new data type called person field. And this data type is going to have two different parameters. It's going to have the value telling us what the value of that specific field is. And it's going to have this other field, this other parameter S, telling us whether or not that field can be sorted. Now this, what we're doing here is actually a bit of a trick uh, from GHC 7.4. This is called data kinds. I don't want to dwell on it too much, but we're basically promoting what used to be a data type with two different data constructors to a data kind with two different type constructors. So it's, it's a very neat trick. Uh, it's, not, it's brand new in 7. Point, actually, maybe it's in 7.2, but it's, uh, it's a relatively new feature, and it's still being worked on. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend using this in your, co in your code yet, but it's definitely on the horizon. So anyway, what we have here is this person field is defined as a gadget. And what we're saying is a person, we have a person name constructor that we're defining. And that person name, we're stating, is a field that has a value of type string, 
and can't be sorted. Uh, for whatever reason, we've decided you're not allowed to sort based on someone's name. Uh, on the next line, we have age, which is an integer, and we're saying it is sortable. And on the next line, we have an ID, which is also an integer, but for this one, we've decided you're not allowed to sort by, uh, by ID. So let's go ahead and look at how we could start to build up an API around th these types. We're going to define a new data type, also Gadget, called person filter. And we want to be able to filter in two different ways. We want to be able to filter based on equality and inequality. And what we want to be able to do is say, okay, I'm going to filter this field where it's equal to a certain value, but I don't want to be able to compare a name to an integer. I want to make sure that I'm only ever comparing a name to a string. So what we've done here is we've taken advantage of those, that phantom type variable a value, and we're forcing it to be equivalent between the field itself and the value we're comparing it to. And the result of this is a filter. And we do the same thing with inequality. For sorting, we have something similar. We're saying that if we want to sort on something, we can only sort if the field is marked as something that can be sorted on. So we have this is, <clears throat> we are, we're saying that the S variable uh, from the, uh, previously has to be is sortable. Let's go ahead and see how that plays out in actual code. We're now able to define a function called query which takes a list of filters and a list of sort fields and then is able to sort, a list of, uh, sort and filter a list of people. So for example, in the first line we see we're able to, do, we're able to say we want to perform a query where, someone, where the name is equal to Alice and that works just fine. We can also do inequality. We're able to say that person name is not equal to Alice. That works too. But as soon as we start throwing in another data type, in this case we're throwing in true as a Boolean, then we get a compile error because the, the phantoms have told us that there's no way that you can compare a name with a Boolean. Similarly with uh, sorting, uh, sorting based on age, the fourth, uh, the fourth example, that works just fine. But if you remember, we defined, we defined an ID as something that couldn't be sorted on, and therefore, that's going to give a compile time error. So again, the idea is we're expressing these invariants that we want to keep in the type system as much as possible. Um, that's probably the most complicated, I, that is the most complicated example in, that slide, in the slide, so uh, don't be overwhelmed at this point. Okay, uh, type parameters. This is another great trick uh, that's been coming up, at least for me it's been coming up more, more often recently. Uh, the idea is, let's give a, again, let's start with the example. I have a file on my, on my hard drive, I have a database, I have something that has a list, a list of, ID, of employees. And some of the employees have an ID number associated with them, and some of them don't. And I want to write a program that's going to read in that list of employees that some of them do and some of them don't have the IDs, give an ID to every single employee who's missing one, and then write out that list to a new file ensuring that every single employee has an ID. So the question is, how are we going to represent this? Now there are a few things that we could do right off the bat. We could say, okay, the employee is going to have a maybe ID. And by having a maybe ID, we're able to pull in the data from the, uh, from the file or the database and assign it either just or nothing, depending on whether or not the value actually exists. And then we're going to go ahead and make sure that every value is now updated to be just, uh, not allowing any nothing values. But the problem is that the type system doesn't actually enforce that. That's something we're enforcing on ourselves. Uh, another alternative would be to define two completely separate data types. We'd have employee with ID and employee without ID. But again, that's, you know, in our simple case here, an employee just has a name and an ID, but most likely there are going to be many more fields available and it's going to become, it's going to become a pain to have to deal with those, those two parallel data types. So instead, what we're able to do is express the employee ID as a type variable. So we have data employee EID. We're saying the employee has some kind of ID. I don't know yet what kind of ID it has, but it has something. Then we define our read employees function, and we can see on the left-hand side, and so on the right-hand side, it's returning a list of employees that might have an ID, that have a maybe employee ID. 
Then we have our assign ID function, which takes an employee that might have an ID and absolutely assigns them with an ID. So the type changes at this point. It used to be an employee with a maybe employee ID, and now it's an employee with an employee ID. And then finally, our write employees function is able to say, I don't want you to pass me any employees that don't have IDs. Everyone must have an ID. And stringing all, the, all of this together is very convenient. We don't have to jump between different kinds of data types. You can see in the last line, we're able to very succinctly read in the list of employees, assign the IDs to everyone, and then write them back out. And if we happened to make a mistake and we didn't assign the IDs, the type system would stop us. It would immediately tell us, no, I'm sorry, you're trying to give me an employee that might have an ID. I want an employee that does have an ID. Okay. And last, last slide in this section, keep it general. Uh, lots of different ideas here. One example, program two type classes when possible. Let's say that you're working on some code which is going to be playing around with strings. It's going to be adding strings, to, it's going to be concatenating strings, it's going to be taking different, you know, people's names and putting them together in different ways. So you decide, okay, if that's fine, I'll program as if I'm dealing with a list of characters. And that works just fine until you decide you're going to switch over to the text package and suddenly you're going to have to rework all of your code. Or you start making implicit assumptions about, or another example, you are playing around with different kinds of data. You're playing around with an integer and you accidentally start adding one, you start playing around with the values when really you're in a function that should have no way of modifying the actual values. So in those cases, the fact that you've, you've specified exactly which kind of function and which kind of data type that you want to do actually makes your code weaker, makes it more weakly typed because you have the ability to perform extra actions. Prime example of that is you have a function that needs to live in some monad, uh, but, you, but you know, with sir, you're convinced that it's only ever going to live in the IO monad. Now the problem is your types no longer, no longer give you strong guarantees that your function won't have side effects. It's entirely possible now at this point that your function could start reading data from files, it could start printing things to standard output, it could start making database connections. It could do lots of different things. So by, having, by keeping things general, programming to just a generic monad, the type system is able to prevent you from making those kinds of mistakes. Now, one of the downsides with this approach to programming is that the error messages that come out of the compiler can be a, a bit confusing. Uh, instead of seeing you tried to add a string to an integer, you'll see something like you tried to add A to B, and you can't do that, uh, which can be a bit confusing. So if you start getting into those cases, my advice is just go ahead and revert temporarily. Go ahead and put in explicit type signatures, put in the actual types that you're dealing with. Compiler messages will get a little bit easier to deal with. You can fix the code that was wrong. And then if you want to, you can go ahead and fix it back up and make, it more, uh, make the types more generic again. So, okay. Uh, uh, Yasmin, are there any questions at this point? No questions have come in. Back to you. Okay. Okay, so we do have time for uh, one last section. Last section is some actual practical examples from USODE. Uh, so let's dive into the boundary issue. This is something that actually we discuss quite a bit in the book and in, some do you know, in the community in general. The idea is that you can, de you can design as wonderful a type system as you want. You can make your code perfect, you can guarantee all your invariants inside your code, but at some point you're gonna have to interact with the outside world. And the outside world isn't nearly as beautiful. The outside world has all these funny things like, oh, well it's really, it's text, but I'm gonna give it to you as binary data, uh, or lots of other things like that. The question is, how do you deal with that? What we have is something, so with the boundary issue, what we say is we keep, we keep strict borders. When some, when some data wants to come into our system, we validate it immediately. We make sure that anything that's coming in is correct. If it's not correct, we don't, we, uh, we don't accept it. And we immediately turn it into strong data. So if we have a program that's expecting textual data that is going to be UTF-8 formatted, we can go ahead and 
check to make sure that it's UTF-8 formatted. If it's not, we re reject the data. If it is, we immediately turn it into text, and no one ever has to ask a question again about what character encoding was, dealt, was being dealt with. On the flip side, we have the rendering, the, out, the data going out of the system. And in that case, our solution is to render at the last moment. Keep things strongly typed as much as possible. You can play around with it inside your program as much as possible. And then, at the very end, convert it into something that the outside world is able to interact with. So one of our big examples for this is type safe URLs. This is, a, this is possibly, the, this is one of the big selling points of USOD that we're able to go ahead and guarantee that we don't have, uh, we don't, we're not generating invalid links. Uh, we're able to introspect our routes very nicely with normal pattern matching. So how do we deal with this? Because ultimately, a request from the user is going to come in as a byte string. It's going to come in in an HTTP request as just a bunch of bytes. So our approach is that as soon as a request comes into our application, we convert it into a, into a, strongly, into a, a value of a strong type. If we can't make that conversion, if the request is invalid, we send a 404 response immediately, and the rest of the application doesn't need to see it. If we get past that, that gatekeeper, we know that the request is valid. On the flip side, when we're rendering our, uh, our values, when we're going ahead and creating our HTML pages, we go ahead and keep it as a type safe URL as long as possible, and at the very last moment, we go ahead and render it into a piece of text. And that means that we're able to introspect the, the values that we're dealing with, whether it's for permission, you know, checking if someone has permissions to access something, whether it's breadcrumbs, request body limiting. We actually use this for a lot of different features in USOD. And you know, what's great here, the compiler is able to completely prevent us from generating invalid links. You know, there's no such thing as splicing together two strings and hoping it's still a valid link. You go ahead, put it together as a value, and the compiler will tell you if you made a mistake. And more importantly, if you change your routes later on, the compiler is able to catch every single place that you, made a, that you use the old version of the links and force you to correct it. So that comes down to our, you know, one of our first points, that we have of, you know, catching bugs at compile time is cheaper than catching, catching them at runtime. We're able to find all of these invalid links immediately, and it might, be pain, it might be a bit of a tedious pain to have to deal with it, but it's much better than the alternative of the bugs going out and then having to rush to deal with it, and it's still a tedious pain. Okay. Another technique we use is we use types, types classes to actually state requirements. One of the examples that comes with the standard libraries, with the transformers library in this case, is we have a type class called monad.io. We can have lots of different kinds of monad stacks built, on, built ultimately on I.O. And by saying this, what we're saying is, I want to be working inside something which allows me to perform I.O. actions. I don't care if it's a reader wrapped around I.O. I don't care if it's writer and state wrapped around I.O. It doesn't matter to me. I just want to be able to read my file. I just want to be able to print something to the screen. Uh, other examples that come out of the USOD world, we have a type class called render message, which we use for our internationalization support. So if we have a function that needs to be able to translate certain kinds of messages for different users, we're able to state that with the type class, saying, yeah, I want to be able to render this to, um, for this application. Or another example is I, have an, I want to be able to write some kind of widget that's going to take advantage of jQuery I want to make sure that the site that I'm, that I'm in has access to the jQuery library. Okay, and one last technique, another one that we use a lot in Yasode is type families. Uh, the basic idea of a type family is to state some kind of a relationship between two data types. Uh, the prime example we have in Yasode is dealing with type safe URLs and the web application. Right, we, have a, we have a data type for representing each application that exists, and associated with it is its URL data type that we use for the type safe URLs. Uh, so what we have is this family called route that says this is the route that's associated with the given app. And when we combine this with type classes, uh, we're able to get some pretty expressive statements. So what you see on the screen right now, we have a type class for URLs that can be rendered into, into text. And our function at the bottom says, 
I want to be able, I want to run this app, but I only want to be able to run apps where the associated URL can be turned into text. So again, this is a very, this is a lot of expressivity coming from the Haskell type system. We said a lot, we gave a lot of information in just a few words. Again, that's the huge power that we're getting by using uh, a type system like Haskell's. Okay. Uh, Yasmin, are there any questions? There are. Um, let's see here. We'll take a first question from Oliver. Oliver asks, on the slide with the employee example, what is the name supposed to mean? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Name was just, a, it was just a, intended as an arbitrary field. I had intended it to be the name of the employee. Uh, it was just any kind of arbitrary data that you might want to have in the employee, nothing particularly important. Okay. Uh, next one is from Nicholas. With Yasud, especially Conduit, you follow an uncommon style of library writing. Providing actual real-world examples instead of only type signatures and very detailed documentation, do you think this is inherently missing in the Haskell community? Um, I don't think it's missing so much anymore. I think that um, a few years ago it was less common. But there's definitely been a push, a very solid push, and a very successful push to making libraries more accessible by, uh, for, uh, for people trying to actually just write code. Uh, I think a lot of the very, you know, for a great example of this is the ISON lab library. Uh, it's a great JSON parsing library. Where, uh, it's incredibly fast. And the documentation there is incredible. The do documentation really gives you step by step, okay, this is what you need to do in order to parse out JSON from some data. Uh, so we're definitely seeing a, a push. Is the documentation in the Haskell world perfect? Of course not. I don't think there's any community that can claim that they've achieved perfect documentation. But I think we're moving in a much better direction, and I think over time it's going to be a situation that improves more and more. Thank you. And we have another one here from Nick. Nick asks, do you think that there is a point where types become too polymorphic and unclear, or is it good to always push for the most general code? That's a really great, great question. That's something that we, uh, we struggled with a lot uh, with, actually, the most, most recently, that was with the design of Conduit. Conduit, at this point, I'm not, con I'm not convinced that we made the right decision. Conduit ends up having six type variables, which can be kind of, it can be quite confusing. Now, I can give you a very long detailed explanation for why each and every one of those type variables exists. Every one of them is valuable and gives us a lot of power. And at the end of the day, you still have six type variables. Uh, that can make it very difficult. Uh, I'll give you a, an example that we went the opposite direction. In, usually when we deal with uh, transformer stacks, we go ahead and just use them as uh, type synonyms. And in the case of Yosode, I think up till version 0 0.8. When we had the handler monad, it was actually, we actually had a G handler T monad transformer that would allow you to layer it on top of any arbitrary underlying monad. And the error messages that came out of this were horrendous. No one could understand what was going on. I couldn't understand what was going on, and I'd written it. Uh, that's usually a bad sign. So I was uh, concerned about it. And what we ended up doing is we greatly limited the, uh, the, gener the generality of the code. We pinned it down to a new type wrapper that forced us to be using a very specific underlying monad, a resource T wrapped around an IO, uh, because that was the one that people really needed. Uh, there, were, there were a few other changes that went along at the same time that allowed us to do it. But basically, having the more specific code was such a win from a usability standpoint, it, it overpowered the fact that we were losing a bit of flexibility in what we were able to express. So I guess, I guess the short answer to what you're asking is, yeah, there's a point. I agree that there is a point at somewhere. Uh, unfortunately, I can't give a formula for when that point is. It's, probably, it's going to be up to each, to each individual to make a decision when they think uh, they've crossed the line into too polymorphic and unclear. Thank you. And we have one final question here. There are invariants which can't be expressed in the type system currently. For example, let's say we have an interpreter for a typed language, and we store the values in a map uh, value. Where value is an 
exists existential. Um, let's see here. What's the rest of the question? I think he's saying, is it justified to use unsafe functions like dynamic cast? Sorry if I'm not getting your question, um, X, who sent that in. If I didn't read it right or say it right, can you correct it? But does that make uh, sense to you, Michael? Yeah. Uh, yes, it does make sense. And the, f the fact is, it's a, it is a limitation. There are some things that we're not able to express right now, or maybe there is a way to express it with Haskell, but we haven't figured out a good way to do it. Or another way to say it, there might be some cases where we really do know how to express it, but it's going to be very difficult to work with that code. Uh, so the fact is, we may not like it. We may not like the fact that we can't use the type system fully in some cases, but in some, in some cases we have to bite the bullet and do it. Sometimes you know, we, have to, we have a certain task. You know, we're talking about the real world. The real world, you're gonna go, you can't go to your boss and say, sorry, I wasn't able to express the, type, the invariant in the type system. I'm not going to be able to do the task. You still have to get it done. Um, so in those, in those kinds of situations, yeah, eventually you're going to, in some cases, you'll, you'll really appreciate the fact that Haskell lets you cheat and go ahead and do some kind of dynamic task. The goal is to minimize those cases as much as possible. Thank you. Oh, it looks like Oliver sent in um, one question, so we'll take this one, folks. Um, how do you feel about the Haskell extensions which move towards dependent types like Agda would provide? Would you encourage their use? Uh, I, I can't give a general answer to that. I would say, in general, I would... I, I would always encourage investigation. I don't think that there's any, there's any feature in the language that I wouldn't say, yeah, we should have a look at it and see if it can provide something useful. Uh, in general, I'm, I, I really like the extensions that have been coming out from the dependently typed world. I think that they've had, you know, I, you know Gaddits, for example, as I showed here, I, I think that they have a, a lot of value. Yeah, we use them extensively and persistent to, uh, to help out, uh, with making it a solid query interface. So I definitely think that there's value. I can't say that, in every, that every single extension that comes out is going to have the right you know, cost-benefit ratio. Some of them might just be too difficult to use, and therefore I wouldn't say that we should be jumping on that bandwagon. But in general, I would say try it out, see how it feels, and experiment. If it gives, if it gives you the results you're looking for, go for it. All right, and with that, we're going to say a very big thank you to you, Michael, for such an outstanding webcast today. Thank you for sharing all your knowledge and tips with us. Thank you very much, Yasmin, and thank you very much, everyone, for attending and uh, listening, and thank you for the excellent questions and feedback. Again, thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody. This will conclude our webcast today. Bye, everyone.